It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Speaker, Ontario's Green Belt includes over 2 million acres of protected land, including some of the most fertile agricultural land in the country. The Green Belt generates nearly $9.6 billion in annual economic activity and supports over 177,000 jobs. It also provides $3.2 billion a year in services like flood protection and water pur purification and stormwater management. Speaker, does the Premier really think this is all a big scam? Government House Leader. Uh, in fact, uh, no, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. In fact, it was a progressive conservative government, you will recall, that brought in the Oak Ridge's Marine Land Planning Act back in 2000. It was a federal conservative government that brought in the Rouge National Urban Park uh, back in uh, 2014, uh, despite the fact that the NDP voted against that. Uh, uh, it was a progressive conservative government here at Queen's Park that expanded uh, uh, the Green Belt. It was, an NDP it was a, a Liberal government supported by the NDP that reopened the Green Belt 17 times without expanding the Green Belt, uh, uh, Speaker. Uh, that is the record of progressive conservative government when it comes to protecting uh, the, the Green Belt, when it comes to protecting the environment. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, we understand that it is very, very important right now the fact that there is a housing crisis, that we have to do everything in our power to remove obstacles so that we can build more homes for the people of the province of Ontario. Bonds? There are over 500,000 people coming to Ontario to participate in what is the economic revival of, uh, of this province. They need a place uh, to live and to call home, and we're going to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Speaker, well, you know, the minister is, is clearly taking a different uh, perspective on this than his premier, and you can't really blame the premier for trying out some new lines to try and change the channel on a topic that has become a very sore point for him. Yeah. And as the questions and the evidence piles up, he's now calling into question the whole premise of the Greenbelt. Speaker, let's talk about scams. How about the one where developers with close ties to the Conservatives somehow knew to buy protected land in the Greenbelt long before the change was made? Yeah. To the Premier, how did these developers get advance notice of his government's intention to carve up the Greenbelt? We talked about this last week, right? Uh, it is no secret to any of us sitting in this House today, it's certainly no secret to progressive Conservatives, that the NDP have an ideological uh, disdain for building homes for the people of the province of Ontario, right? It's not just them here, it's their federal cousins in Ottawa, right? They held the balance of power in Ottawa like they did here, and they're not talking in Ottawa about removing obstacles to build more homes, just like the NDP didn't when they held the balance of power here. So, Mr. Speaker, let me be clear to the Leader of the Opposition. We on this side of the House, progressive Conservatives, don't believe that the people of the province of Ontario should be reliant only on the government. We believe that the people should be given the tools to succeed. Because when they are given the tools to succeed, that is when Ontario prospers most, Mr. Speaker. And in order to do that, we are bringing more jobs and opportunity to the province of Ontario. Spons? But it is also completely unacceptable that young Canadians, young Ontarians, should be offering 10, 15, 21 times in one instance to buy a home and not be successful. That's not Ontario, and we're going to rectify that. The final supplementary. Speaker, let me be, we all know. Ripping up the green belt for the benefit of a few wealthy insiders is not a housing plan. <laughs> Speaker, let's get this straight. They won't tell us who shared information about the green belt carve up in advance of the November 2022 announcement. They won't acknowledge that developers who benefited from this were at private family fundraisers of the Premier. They won't release the records of who in the Premier's office was sharing this information. And now they're trying to distract by saying that the green belt is not a thing. Speaker, the Premier owes Ontarians a straight answer. Is he planning to open up more sections of the Green Belt for his developer friends, yes or no? Members of Peace, Peace, Peace. Government House Leader, can Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We've been very clear right from the beginning that we intend to remove obstacles 
We intend to remove obstacles that are in the way of building new homes for the people of the province of Ontario. It is no secret that since we got elected, jobs and opportunity are coming back to the province of Ontario. It's no secret. We've added 300,000 jobs. But the job isn't done, Mr. Speaker. We have to continue to do more. As I said in my first answer, it is unacceptable that we have young Ontarians offering 16, 17, in one instance, 21 times a grandparent called me and said 21 times for a home that they didn't get. That is unacceptable. So we're going to remove obstacles. We know that they like obstacles, but you know what that has resulted in, Mr. Speaker? In April 2023, this past April, we reached an annual rate of housing starts of over 110,664. That is one of the highest Response. levels of records. Do you know how we're doing that? We're doing it by removing obstacles, Mr. Speaker, so that we can get more homes in the ground, so that people have the opportunity, and so that all Ontarians can share in the same dream that all of us here have, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Health, between 2021 and 2022, Niagara experienced a 55 per cent increase in EMS offload delays. And in the latter half of 2022, a total of over $1.7 million of the regional levy was spent to address the record number of EMS calls. In 2022, Niagara EMS incurred almost 34,000 offload delay hours, which is equivalent to 24 paramedics for 365 days. Will the minister commit to reimbursing the over $1.7 million spent on additional offload delays and ensure that Niagara is funded for an additional health team to help address the underlying causes of our EMS crisis, as requested by Niagara's municipal leaders? The members will take their seats. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question, because it is an important one. You know, we know that the status quo is not acceptable. Having said that, of course, our government uh, does fund ambulance partnerships with our uh, municipal partners, but I want to go specifically to what have we done, because we know status quo is not acceptable. We're returning ambulances to communities faster through the dedicated offload nursing program, and through that program, we've actually increased ambulance availability by over 600,000 hours. These are individuals whose patients are being directly passed over and looked after by the local hospitals. And equally important, we're having paramedics who can now go back into community faster to make sure that we deal with these wait times and, off and offload delays. We're providing timely and appropriate care in the community through the, extent, the expansion Response. of the patient care model that allows paramedics to actually provide community-based care to some 911 patients. These are concrete, specific examples of what we have done as a government to assist and make sure that status quo thank you a supplementary question a member for niagara falls thank you speaker back to the premier those staffs staff should be con concerning to any government and it's a result of health care crisis this crisis fueled by the government disrespect of frontline health care workers has created holy created those health significant offload delays in our hospital Niagara deserves to be refunded the $1.7 million of taxpayer dollars that have gone into the offload delays, and we can't continue to go down this road. Three of Niagara's hospitals consistently rank in the bottom quarter of offload times. Shame. Speaker, will the local leaders from Niagara here today, will the Premier listen to their solutions, commit to ensuring a long-term solution to EMS offload delays immediately? Thank you. Minister of Health. Speaker, so a couple more examples of what we have been doing to ensure that our paramedic partners in community have the resources and services they need. We're investing in new technologies across central ambulance communications centres, including, of course, in Niagara, to lower wait times and modernize dispatch services. That program in place in Niagara and Peel is making sure that people are triaged appropriately and getting the services they need as quickly as possible. We've also increased non-ambulance transportation for medically stable pa patients. All of these things together are ensuring that while we continue to train and hire more paramedics in community, because of course the, the uh, Learn and Stay program also has a component for our ambulance uh, operators and our paramedics. So we're doing this work and we're getting the Response. job done because it has been sorely ignored for too long. 
The final supplementary, the members of St. Catharines. Speaker to the Premier. After the passing of a beloved physician, countless seniors like Debbie Clark's 89-year-old mother are struggling to find care amid a shortage of 100 family doctors in Niagara. Despite reaching out to 50 clinics, the Clark family have found no relief. Our overworked, aging doctors cannot bear this burden alone. To alleviate this strain on hospitals and EMS, we are urgently need increased support for doctors' recruitment in Niagara Region. Speaker to the Premier, will you commit to reviewing and enhancing this crucial aid, ensuring our seniors have access to essential care when they need it the most? Mr. Health. Speaker, the member opposite is completely um, acknowledging that the status quo is not appropriate. You know, with the passage of Bill 60, we now have as of right in the province of Ontario. What does as of right mean? It means that if you are a practicing physician, clinician in any other Canadian jurisdiction and you have a job in Ontario, you can practice immediately and not have to get to it. It is our government, Speaker that has now put in place two new medical schools in Brampton, in Scarborough. What does that mean? It means we are planning ahead, unlike respectfully the members from the NDP and the Liberals who actually cut residency spots, and we now are facing 250 less physicians are practicing in the province of Ontario because of the previous work of the NDP and the Liberal government. We're getting it done. We're making those changes. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiewetanong. Uh, speaker, uh, last week the Premier uh, made very concerning uh, statements about mining projects in the north, specifically the Ring of Fire. Speaker, um, we know these projects cannot proceed without the free, prior, informed consent of First Nations. When the Premier um, says the Ring of Fire is going to get built without that consent, it will lead to conflict. Mm -hmm. Why does the Premier think this is the right way to move forward? Mm -hmm. Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, and what the Premier and this government uh, believe in is building consensus, Mr. Speaker, shared and common interests around legacy infrastructure that will help develop Northern Ontario. This has been something that we have said time and time again. We're not dividing and conquering, pitting one community against the other like the member opposite uh, appears to be. Instead, we want to have open and frank discussions about the kind of legacy infrastructure, energy, road access. Mr. Speaker, all of those communities on diesel generation. We have a rare opportunity here to move forward on legacy infrastructure for this region, Mr. Speaker, bring communities a better opportunity economically, socially, access to health and services programs, and, Mr. Speaker, build a world-class mining system Response. that will serve the world over in the electric vehicle battery supply chain. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, speaker, um, the Premier needs to, get, needs to uh, stop getting bad advice from this minister. <clears throat> First Nations are opposed to decisions that are being made on their treaty territories without their consent. First Nations are not going to stand up for this approach. We've been unequal partners for far too long. Besides, uh, it's, a very, it's very colonial. Speaker, if First Nations come to a consensus that they do not want mining in their territories, then that needs to be respected. If this government gets told no, by First Nations. Will they respect that? Members will please take their seats. To reply, the Minister of Mines. Thank you very much for that question. In an article in Watate News, MPP Saul Mamakwa stated, I think TKG is an example of what working together can look like. Ooh. We can prosper together on some of the spin-offs happening in the work in Northern Ontario. John Glover, CEO of Minoham Development LP. It's all about three First Nations who have shared territory coming together to create a business that benefits all three communities. We're very involved in the mining sector. 
and the heavy construction sector. We couldn't agree, Mr. Speaker, and that is why we're so disappointed the NDP and the Liberals did not support our bill. This is exactly what the Building More Mines Act is about. It's about government working more efficiently so mining co companies can create lasting Spons. partnerships with Indigenous communities and economic development for the entire regions in the North. You stop the clock for a second. So once, once again, I'm going to remind members to refer to each other by their riding name or their ministerial title as applicable, not by their personal name. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Mm. Entrepreneurs and companies choose their plants with their roots in communities in southwestern Ontario for many reasons. With a talented workforce and ample opportunities, there's no shortage of reasons why it, it's one of the best places in, to operate and grow a business. With billions of dollars in investment that the government has been attracting across the province, my constituents want to know that they're also getting their fair deal. And the government is there to help their businesses stay competitive. Speaker, can the minister explain why our government is and what they're doing to support businesses, namely manufacturers in Ontario communities? To reply, Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, we all know that Ontario communities are the most competitive places to invest and grow. By lowering the cost of business by $8 billion every year, we've attracted record investments here into Ontario. Just last week, Trust Corp in Palmerston announced a $10 million investment in a manufacturing facility. Now, they make a unique, sustainable PVC-based wall and ceiling panel, which is a really modern replacement for traditional drywall. And with a $1.5 million investment from the province, they're adding 68 good-paying jobs. Speaker, Ontario has attracted $1 billion in new investments like that one from Trescor through our regional development programs. This is the commitment we make to the people of southwestern Ontario. Supplementary question. Back to the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. It's great to hear the people of southwestern Ontario have not been forgotten by this government. It's no question that programs like the Regional Development Program help businesses power our province's economy. Here, here. Beyond attracting the world's investments, we need to ensure conditions are right for our own local businesses and entrepreneurs to succeed here at home. Speaker, can the minister further elaborate on how our government is supporting local businesses and entrepreneurs to start and grow? Good question. For economic development. For years, the Liberals and their NDP partners stifled economic growth by making it too expensive to do business here in Ontario. They sent hundreds of thousands of jobs fleeing the province. But our government has reversed all of that. We've eliminated red tape, lowered hydro rates, and reduced the taxes that the Liberals and NDP piled on, sending those businesses running. We've attracted record levels of investment and jobs, $25 billion in auto investments, $3 billion in life sciences, and billions more in the tech sector. And we're also helping entrepreneurs with support from our regional innovation centres found all through Ontario and our small business centres found in most Ontario communities. Speaker, this is exactly what businesses and entrepreneurs needed to turn their dreams Spons. into jobs. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Stellantis is now reconsidering their battery plant deal in Windsor. Thousands of new jobs are on the line. They've actually stopped construction. The impact that this will have on my community is significant. The union representing these workers has successfully bargained in these investments, but they need all levels of government to use every tool they have to secure this investment. We can't sit by idly and watch more good-paying auto jobs leave this province, or more specifically, my area. What is the Premier doing to ensure that this deal does not fall through? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. You know, Speaker, um, we've been back in this legislature for almost a year, and we've not had one question 
asked of us. Not a peep about how we landed $25 billion in auto investments here in Ontario. <laughs> Speaker, not one question on how we landed that $5 billion deal with Stellantis and what our commitment was. Well, I will tell you, we have a signed agreement with Stellantis, which we are honouring to the letter. It's the same deal we made with Volkswagen, for your information. But now it's up to the federal government to honour their commitment to Stellantis and the workers in Windsor. Thank you, Speaker. I've actually stood in this legislature several times as the wife of an auto worker and told the government Order. they need credit to the workers, Order. too, instead of taking it all for your— Stop the clock. The member for Essex will come to order. Start the clock. I recognize the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. I've stood in this legislature many, many times as the wife of an auto worker and told this government, you need to give credit to, where the, to the workers and not just— Member for Essex is warned. will come to order. Start the clock. Member for Windsor West. Speaker, the member for Essex can try and shut me down all he wants, but I'm the wife of an auto worker and I've been on the picket lines with these workers, and I know they bargain in these deals. And you keep taking credit for all of it instead of giving it to the workers. And remind the member to make her comments through the chair. The member for Windsor West has the floor. Speaker, this premier has a track record of not acting when auto jobs Order. were leaving this province or Windsor specifically. We saw this Order. in Windsor with NEMAC, the third shift at Windsor Assembly Plant, side, come to and with General Motors in office. Stop the clock. Okay. Member for Brampton North will come to order. The Minister of Education will come to order. The member for Windsor West has the floor. She has the right to ask her question. And I need to be able to hear it. Start the clock. The member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. They can shout me down all they want, and I'll continue to raise the voice of my community. Order. This Premier has a track record of not acting when auto jobs are leaving this province. Order. We saw this in Windsor with NEMAC, the third shift at Windsor Assembly Plant, and with General Motors in Oshawa. My community deserves a government that will do everything in its power to not only protect current auto jobs, but secure new ones. These are good-paying auto jobs with benefits Order. and pensions. Stellantis deserves the same consideration and government support as any other automaker in the province, and so do these workers. What specifically is the Premier going to do to support Windsor workers and ensure we don't lose this investment? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Again, it's great to be able to rise for the very first time to a question from the NDP. <laughs> they, they did not ask in the last year. They did not ask the fact that Bloomberg has now said that Canada is ranked second in the global EV battery supply chain. We went from zero to $25 billion, Speaker, without one question or comment from the NDP. They did not ask us the details back in uh, March of 2022 when we did the $5 billion. They did not ask a question about the $7 billion Volkswagen deal, and I can tell you my signature is on that contract. I can tell you as well they did not ask a question about the deal we did with Ford, Honda, GM, Umicore, Magna, anything. But I will tell you, Speaker, we have a signed agreement with Stellantis, which we are honouring to the letter, and we encourage the federal government to live up to the commitment they made to Stellantis. The next question, 
The member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Ministry of Transportation. Boat Transit is a part of Ontario's vital transportation network. In my riding of Scarborough Centre, many people rely on Go Bus for easy, reliable travel across the GTA and beyond. With over 70 million riders using the GO service every year, that is why our province must keep pace with technology that will reduce emissions. Our government must continue to make investments in transportation technology that helps the environment and is good for people. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is expanding clean, green transit options for Ontario? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question. Zero emission technology is the way of the future. And that's why last week I joined the Premier and my colleagues from Durham to announce the addition of two brand new electric buses. This is a first for Go Transit. Speaker, these new electric buses are a significant step forward for our government's plan to be a global leader in clean transportation. Starting May 15, these buses will hit the roads on four routes in my colleague's riding of Scarborough Centre. The buses will be identifiable by their unique exterior, which features a lightning bolt. Once on board, commuters will experience a quieter ride and they'll have access to USB chargers. Speaker, thanks to the leadership of the Premier, we're making it easier and greener to travel on GO Transit. And the supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for giving the update to the House so they can be aware of what they're doing. It's good the government is taking steps to help the environment while also making travel easier for riders. People in my community are eager to be part of the eco-friendly transit that will lower greenhouse gas emissions. Unlike the Liberals, who fail to invest in transit for Ontario hardworking people and family. Our government must be focused on a better plan. These new electric buses are a good step forward as we build a cleaner province. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to build clean energy transportation networks? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, our plan for GO Expansion will change the way that you travel on GO Transit. Speaker, GO Expansion will convert trains from diesel to electric powered. They will be faster, quieter, and greener. On top of that, thanks to the work of the Premier, we're going to see thousands of Ontario made electric vehicles on our roads in the next few years. Speaker, despite the lack of interest or the opposition from the members opposite, Speaker, our strong EV manufacturing sector that our government has been building, access to critical minerals that we have been spearheading, and, and all electric GO buses signal to the world that Ontario is a leader in electric vehicle technology. A clean transportation network, Speaker, is the future, and our government is at the forefront of this revolution every step of the Response. way. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. All of Ontario's tribunals are in crisis. Since the Conservatives formed government in 2018, the Landlord-Tenant Board backlog has grown threefold to 38,000 people. The Human Rights Tribunal has grown twofold to 9,000 people. And the Licensed Appeal Tribunal has grown fourfold, Speaker, to over 16,204 persons. How many more scathing ombudsman's report does the Premier need to have on his desk before he takes immediate action to reduce the horrendous backlog by depoliticizing the appointment process, Speaker, and reinstating in-person hearings as recommended by legal experts. Thank you. To reply, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank my, my friend across the aisle for asking Tribunal Ontario's question, uh, Mr. Speaker, because we've been wondering at what point the opposition will support us mm -hmm. in moving forward to double the number of adjudicators, Mr. Speaker. Oh, okay. We, we, we've been wondering at what point the opposition will support us in terms of put, updating technology that the ombudsman said the Liberals. Stop the clock. 
Member for Ottawa South, come to order. The Attorney General has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. He's preempting the fact that the Ombudsman said that the Liberals left the place in shambles, Mr. Oh, Speaker. Okay. That's what he's preempting. Oh, now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I would like to see the NDP stand up and support us in the investments we're making in terms of the staffing, the adjudicators, the technology, Mr. Speaker. I'll have more to say in the supplementary. In the supplementary question, the member for University of Rosedale. Thank you. My question is back to the Attorney General. Watchdog Tribunal Watch questions whether the Conservatives understand the depth of the crisis at the Landlord Tenant Board, a crisis that has gotten worse under their term and continues yep. to this very day. If you can't even acknowledge a crisis, how are you going to fix it? I quote Tribunal Watch, it is difficult to have any confidence in the ability of Tribunal Order. Ontario and the LTB to course correct and address the serious issues raised by the Ombudsman. My question is to the Minister. I am imploring this government to take their head out of the sand and work with groups like Tribunal Watch to fix our tribunal system. Can you do it? The Attorney General. We can do Mr. It. Speaker, I'd like to welcome the opposition to the party, Mr. Speaker. We're already getting the job done. We've doubled the number of adjudicators. We put in a brand new technology system who the Ombudsman says we're on the right side of this. He sees optimism. He sees that we're moving in the right direction. Mr. Speaker, we've added more staff, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure that we have the people in the places with the tools to get the job done, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad that the opposition has tuned in. If they were paying attention before, they might have actually supported us on some of these advancements. Here, here. The next question. Order. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, apparently Electric Avenue is the new theme song for Ontario. I'm happy we are building electric vehicles in Ontario, but if everybody were to buy an electric vehicle and plug it in, most streets couldn't handle it without local electricity grid infrastructure upgrades. I want to spur on this government to plan ahead, but I don't trust them to plan ahead because they started their term of office by pulling out EV chargers. Doug Ford talks about an electric avenue, but until he gets the grid infrastructure rocking down to Electric Avenue, he's just living on a prayer. Could the minister tell the House why the government hasn't announced the long-term plans needed to build out the local electricity grid infrastructure for handling mass adoption of electric vehicles in Ontario? Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Okay. The government side will come to order so that I can hear the member who has the floor, who legitimately has the floor and has the right to ask a question. Which I need to hear. Start the clock. The response. Minister of Energy. Well, I'd be pleased to uh, respond to that question. Mr. Speaker, we endured 15 long years of bad medicine from that government, Mr. Speaker. A Liberal government that drove up electricity prices across our province, Mr. Speaker, drove jobs out of our province, Mr. Speaker. Since we formed government in 2018, we've been bringing them back. We've been bringing them back by the thousands, Mr. Speaker. And instead of a disastrous plan, a failed plan that even their former premier admits was her biggest mistake, Mr. Oh, Speaker. Right. We're getting it right. The fundamentals are right. Low hydro, low taxes, making sure that companies want to invest in Ontario's wealth and growth, and we're Response. seeing it on a record pace, Mr. Speaker, including in the electric vehicle sector. And I'll have more to say about the supply that's coming, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, speaker, in Palo Alto, California, one in five households have an electric vehicle. They're way ahead of us, and they are encountering the fact that serious planning and years of work, for example, upgrading transformers, will be needed to electrify cars and home heating in their community. We know that we have to burn less fossil fuels. We know that new nuclear power will take at least a decade to make a real difference. We know that part of the solution is communities using more electricity while generating and storing power themselves. That will require distributed energy systems. 
I know the minister agrees with me that there is a holy trinity of modern energy, reliable, affordable, and sustainable. Will the minister commit today to work with local distribution companies and to aggressively pursue the piloting and build-out of the local electricity grid infrastructure needed for a green future? Minister of Energy can respond. Mr. Speaker, you know, the member across is a good man, he's a nice man, but he wants us to become California, Mr. Speaker, a jurisdiction that on one day mans electric or mandates electric vehicles and on the next day sends out a notice to tell people that they shouldn't charge their vehicles, Mr. Speaker. We are not going to become California. That's why we have a plan, one that's working, Mr. Speaker. We're investing in our large nuclear facilities, Mr. Speaker. We have four four of our can-do reactors that are currently down for refurbishment. When they come back, that's 3,400 megawatts wow. of clean, reliable power Fantastic. that is going to power our future, Mr. Speaker. Fantastic. Those refurbishments are al alone at Bruce and Darlington are enough to power the City of Toronto for another 35 years, but we're not stopping there, Mr. Speaker. We're building the first grid-scale small modular reactor in the G7 here in Ontario. Wow. We're building the largest battery storage facility in Canada here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We're procuring the power that we're going to need to power our growth. Thank you. The next question. Member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My speaker, uh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Alberta's provincial government recently, recently declared a state of emergency due to an unprecedented early start to their wildfire season. As tens of thousands of hectares burn, smoke from these fires has already reached the Yukon, Northwest Territories and Nunavut. Several communities and rural areas have been evacuated, with more than 24,000 people forced to leave their homes. Our government understands that now is the time for unity. We must stand with our fellow Canadians in Alberta and support them during this difficult time. So through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please share how our, how our government is assisting the province of, of Alberta in fighting against these destructive wildfires? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member from Carleton for the question. Uh, speaker, as uh, as the member from Carleton mentioned, Alberta is going through an incredibly difficult and unprecedented wildfire season right now, and our thoughts are very much with the people of Alberta. But, Mr. Speaker, so are our actions. We're proud to be part of numerous mutual aid agreements with provinces across Canada and countries around the world, and these agreements allow for the sharing of resources to minimize the burden on any single jurisdiction during exceptional fire seasons. And just as we benefited from support from partners in our time of need, we offer our help when our friends need it. Mr. Speaker, my ministry has deployed over 177 staff, including crews and an incident management team, to support firefighting efforts in Alberta. And, Speaker, we'll continue to stay in close Response. contact with Alberta as they continue their fight with wildfires so that Albertans displaced can return home sooner. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am proud that our government is working across provincial borders to help the people of Alberta when they need it the most. And we are grateful to the Ontarians who are supporting these communities. However, the unfortunate reality is that summer in Ontario can also mean the risk of wildfire. Forest fires can be devastating for communities, people, businesses, property and livestock. That's why our government must continue to build on the progress and investments that we have made and continue to put practices in place that will help to reduce risk and improve public safety. Speaker, through you, can the minister please elaborate on the strategies our government has in place for wildland fire management? Thank you. Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, again, I want to thank the member for the question. And you know, if a province or a country is seeking in, uh, increased fire activity or seeing increased fire activity, they can place requests for wildland fire support and resources through the Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Centre and they would coordinate the movement of personnel and equipment as needed. And as the member opposite mentioned, Ontario has been fortunate to have a slow start to our wildland fire season. Nevertheless, our ministry has been working hard to ensure we have ample resources to manage our own fire season. In fact, Speaker, in 2023, our government launched a high recruitment and retention program to help bolster our wildfire prevention 
intervention force. This allows Ontario to provide our provincial counterparts in other parts of Canada with much needed support while keeping enough personnel on standby across our province. Speaker, our government is proud Response. to lend a helping hand to the people of Alberta while continuing to protect Ontarians. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, my office hears from hundreds of constituents every day who are struggling to keep up with the cost of living. I'm sure the Premier does too. We recently heard from Parveen, who moved to Ontario five years ago and has been living in a cramped one-bedroom apartment with her husband and three children. This is the reality for so many young families across the province as they are forced to make these difficult choices just to make ends meet. Yep. So my question is, what concrete actions is this government taking to address the rental crisis in Ontario for such families? Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. Through you to the member, you know, our plan is working. We just received uh, the April numbers, and uh, from a year-to-date basis, from January to April, we saw in Ontario 27,000 427 housing starts. It's a 16 percent increase compared to the same period. Rental housing construction, to directly to the member's question, right on track. Over 7,000 starts so far this year, more than double the amount of rental starts we had in a similar period last year. We're going to continue to build upon that success with bills that we've got, not just before the House, but also um, the fact that under the leadership of Premier Ford, we committed to Ontarians last summer that every year of a re-elected government, we would build upon our success. The numbers prove it, Speaker. Fine. <laughs> Supplementary question. Sure. Speaker, the price of rent, groceries, gas, hydro has gone through the roof under this government. There is nothing to applaud. From the Liberal 60K wait, 60,000 wait list for housing, we now have under this Conservatives 85,000 85, who are waiting for housing, Speaker. To rent a two-bedroom apartment in Scarborough now almost equals a family's entire paycheck. Despite Parveen's best effort, she cannot find a home for her family. They're worried that they actually have to leave behind the community they are part of, the, 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 the health care services, the schools that their, her uh, kids go to. They have to leave all of those things just to make, just to survive. So again to the Premier, how will your government help families like Parveen survive so they are not driven out of their communities and out of our province? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So this is exactly why the government's committed to a housing supply action plan bill every year under the leadership of Premier Ford. You know what's different, Speaker? It would be nice if New Democrats would actually stand up and support increased housing supply in our province. You directly in your city, 178 percent increase this year to date for housing starts. Wow. We're going to continue to build upon That's that, great. but every single measure, every bill, every initiative you vote against, your party votes against, we need to have collaboration and cooperation amongst all levels of government. We're going to continue to build on these numbers. The numbers speak for themselves. Record setting them. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Morning, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Ontario is seeing strong economic growth with incredible new investments in our province's electric vehicle and EV battery manufacturing industries. Investments by our government in a partnership with Volkswagen for the new Gigafactory in St. Thomas and other major auto and battery manufacturing projects are all positive signs that the electrification of transportation continues and that manufacturing jobs are returning to Ontario finally. However, there are concerns about the capacity of our current energy grid and the sustainability for long-term growth. Investments and partnerships with battery energy producers are leading to economic growth in the province, but Ontarians need reassurance that our government is developing reliable energy solutions for the present and for the future. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is addressing Ontario's energy Question. infrastructure needs? Minister of Energy. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to uh, thank the member from Southwestern Ontario, where there's a lot of growth going on, Mr. Speaker, because of the environment we we've created. And I can assure him, yes, we are going to have the power they need for all that growth and investment. I've been working since day one, since becoming the Minister of Energy, to ensure that we had a plan so that our electricity grid could support the growing electrification and the growth in our economy that we're seeing. And our work, again, includes uh, building Canada's first small modular reactor at Darlington, the first on-grid in the G7. It's going to be online in late 2028. Uh, the first uh, battery storage facility, Oneida, down uh, with partnership with the Six Nations of the Grand River. We're also uh, we've got the largest battery storage procurement out in the field right now with the independent electricity system operator, largest in the country's history. We're leading the way, Mr. Speaker, on Spons. building energy. And the former Liberal government, as I mentioned earlier, that drove manufacturing jobs out of our province, we're making sure we've got the energy to bring them back, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Ensuring that our government has a solid plan in place to secure the electricity this province needs to continue to power the growth and prosperity of Ontario. The people of Ontario are pleased to see that increasing electrification acts across many sectors of our economy, such as transportation and green steel making. In his response, the minister mentioned Ontario's competitive procurement process for energy storage. The people of Ontario deserve an explanation about what actions our government is taking to help our province move forward in adopting additional forms of energy supply. Individuals also want information and assurances about the reliability of Ontario's power grid. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to support Ontario's overall energy strategy? Minister of Energy. Well, thanks again uh, to the member opposite. The experts at the ISO, the Independent Electricity System Operator, have indicated that uh, generation from natural gas is our insurance policy to have the lights on, to ensure that when you walk into one of these new facilities, Mr. Speaker, that they're going to be able to operate and that prices are going to stay low for the long term, Mr. Speaker. But Ontario does have one of the cleanest electricity systems in the world, Mr. Speaker, and we're doing everything we can to ensure it stays that way by investing in our large nuclear reactors and our small nuclear reactors. As I mentioned earlier, we have four of our nuclear reactors that are down now for refurbishment, Mr. Speaker. That's 3,400 megawatts of power at the Darlington and Bruce sites that are going to be coming back on over the next number of years, ensuring clean, reliable energy for our system, energy that's going to continue to Spons. be there for all of the new investments that come our way. If the NDP had their way, those reactors wouldn't come back at all, Mr. Speaker, and neither would the jobs that are flocking back to Ontario. Question, number four, Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The Dean family reached out to my office last week. Their three-year-old son, Weston, has been on a wait list for an autism assessment for over a year at Ron Joyce. While stuck on this list, Weston has become increasingly dangerous and self-injurious. They are desperate to get this assessment done, knowing they will have another long wait to access services and funding through the OAP. Private assessments cost a minimum of $3,000, certainly out of reach for so many families. Speaker, why are families still facing this enormous barrier to get their children the assessments they so desperately need? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, Speaker, and thank the uh, member for the question. Mr. Speaker, when we formed government in 2018, we saw an Ontario autism program that was broken. Families and children and youth were not receiving the service. That was under that government, Mr. Speaker, and it was always supported by the NDP. Mr. Speaker, only 25 per cent of the children were receiving services. This may have been okay and acceptable by them and the previous government. It isn't acceptable under our government, Mr. Speaker, which is why we doubled the Ontario Autism Program, which is why we created a program, Mr. Speaker, that was developed by the community for the community, Mr. Speaker. Now, children, youth, families have access to more services than ever before, before they had access to one service, Mr. Speaker. Now, 
I'm happy to announce, Mr. Speaker, that this year we are increasing the support in the program by an additional 10 per cent so that we can Fonts. get more children, more youth, more family service. No thanks to the NDP, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Speaker, when this government came into place, the wait list for autism was 24,000, and today the wait list is over 60,000 exactly, dollars exactly. or 60,000 children. Exactly. Speaker, the Dean family lives in fear and stress of waiting for that assessment call, fear of their son suffering severe head injuries and bodily harm. This is a three-year-old child. They have been told that their wait will still be up to another two years just to get the assessment. Two more years of no hope in sight, of no supports for their child who is suffering. Can the minister please tell families like the deans what his new plans are for the assessment program, for the autism program, to ensure that they are done in a timely manner? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for the question. Mr. Speaker, to every single family, Weston, and every single children, youth, and family in this province, we told you from day one that we're not going to leave anyone behind, Mr. Speaker, which is why, again, the member referenced the wait list, Mr. Speaker. 8,500 children were receiving services before under the previous government, supported by the NDP. Today, more than 40,000 children and youth are receiving services, Mr. Speaker. Why? Because we doubled the funding, Mr. Speaker, and we're further increasing that. Why? Because we want to make sure that the children, youth, and families are receiving the supports and services they need, Mr. Speaker. Now, again, previous, the NDP under the previous government had the opportunity to expedite this. They didn't do it, Mr. Speaker. It took this Premier, it took this government to say, we're not going to leave anyone behind, Mr. Speaker. So, we Response. will continue to make sure that the programs, now families, as I said, Mr. Speaker, they only had access to one program. Now there are multiple pathways to service, Mr. Speaker, and there's more work to do. We're going to get Thank you. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Red Tape and Reduction. Mr. Speaker, Ontario was one of the most overly regulated jurisdictions, not just in Canada, but in North America, prior to this government getting elected in 2018. Mr. Speaker, for 15 years, unnecessary regulations were stifling growth, limiting job opportunities, and making life harder for everyone. That's why, Mr. Speaker, under this Premier and government, we actually have a Ministry of Red Tape Reduction that is dedicated specifically to reducing unnecessary and burdensome red tape and making Ontario a place to live, grow and thrive. Under this Premier and this Minister, Mr. Speaker, we are seeing Ontario rejuvenate and grow and improving the lives of everyone. And so through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister Question. please provide us with some highlights of how our government's actions under Premier Ford have benefited the great region of Niagara? Thank you. Parliamentary Assistant Member for Niagara West. Thank you very much. Member for the question, the Niagara region has experienced a renaissance since this government came to office in 2018. We are experiencing currently record low unemployment. Jobs are coming back to our region. We're seeing investments in the areas that matter most. A couple of examples of this in various ministries. We are seeing a new hospital being built in my riding, the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital. We're seeing new hospitals being built across the region, including the advancement of the new 1.3 million square feet being added to the South Niagara hospital. We are seeing new long-term care homes spring up across the region. When I, first for, when I first was elected, we had 16 hospice beds. There are now 40 hospice beds in the Niagara region. Incredible investments in health care. We've seen the Brock Nursing School go from 300 students to 600 students, and we've seen thousands of manufacturing jobs come back to a region that for too long was left behind. The people of Niagara know that in the, this government, Once. the world doesn't end at the Burlington Skyway. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for his response. Mr. Speaker, as the minister has said, reducing red tape is a key part of building a stronger economy and improving services for Ontarians. That's why our government is continuing to bring forward burden reduction packages. 
This adds to our strong track record of improving access to government services and making it easier to invest and build in Ontario. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant provide us with some more highlights on how our government's policies have helped grow and improve the renaissance in, Ni in the Niagara region? Thank you. Member for Niagara West can reply. Again, my thanks to the member opposite. One of the crucial ways that our government makes the investments and the changes that are necessary to drive prosperity for our province and for the Niagara region is by listening. And I know that today members from the Niagara region are here to meet with cabinet ministers. I'll be sitting down with them and Premier Ford later this afternoon to speak about the incredible investments that are coming into the Niagara region. A couple of examples of this. The homelessness prevention program was expanded by 86 percent to $20 million annualized. Supports that go to the most vulnerable in our communities. We are building housing in the Niagara region to make sure that the dream of home ownership becomes a reality. We are expanding GO train services across the Niagara region to make sure that people can get from A to B faster, easier, and smarter. We're also making sure that all of these investments are focused on the well-being of our communities, building connected communities where people have the opportunity to build a better life for them and their families. With the leadership of this premier and this government, we're getting it done for the people of Niagara. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. A couple weeks ago, the Leader and I visited the Sexual Assault Support Centre in Kitchener, and we were both alarmed to learn about their lack of resources. Funding for sexual assault victims has not increased since 2011. In fact, funding is reduced by 17 per cent compared to 10 years ago because of inflation and because of increased uh, need. Forty people on a wait list used to be a crisis, but now there are 270 people waiting uh, for, for counselling, and they've had the courage to come forward and ask for help, and that help is not there for them. So my question to the Premier, to this government, why hasn't funding been increased and annualized for sexual assault centres across the province of Ontario? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member uh, for the very important question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, our government is working across government to make sure that every single person in this province is supported, and that is making, making sure, Mr. Speaker, the supports are there for not just for the, for the victims, Mr. Speaker, but for uh, preventative measures. Uh, this is the government that has increased investments in all levels in every corner of this province to make sure that every single person is receiving the support, Mr. Speaker. It, that means in the members' region, all across the board, Mr. Speaker, the fundings have increased under our government. We'll make sure those preventative measures are there to support, and also, Mr. Speaker, all for the victims, to make sure that every single victim is receiving the support that they need throughout the process. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. In fact, funding was cancelled in 2018 by this government, and that funding has not been uh, caught up. Uh, Minister, SASC is frantically fundraising to try to keep their wait list down. Demand is growing with a 58 per cent increase in counselling requests since the pandemic. They only have one bed for human trafficking survivors. SASC had secured two beds last year through temporary funding, and those two beds were always full. The need is so profound, and now they're down to one bet. Because this crisis centre is in crisis, they spend so much time fundraising and chasing the money. Does the minister agree that trauma agencies shouldn't have to fundraise to keep women and children safe in Niagara, in Peterborough, in Toronto, in Kitchener-Waterloo? It is just not right. Of children, community, and social services. Thanks very much, Speaker. Again, uh, all women, Speaker, deserve uh, to, stay, to live in safety and security, Mr. Speaker. It's that simple. And our government is constantly working to ensure that women can live free from the fear of threats, exploitation, and violence, Mr. Speaker. We have made investments, we have launched, launched programs, and have passed legislation aimed at, at ending violence against women. Mr. Speaker, to the point, the investment that I was referring to earlier, $240 million, Mr. Speaker, uh, invested for victims of violence. 
$10.2 million for violence prevention initiatives that I was referring to earlier, Mr. Speaker. And we have invested in a 24-hour hotline across the province in over 200 languages, Mr. Speaker, to in help ensure those affected by violence or se sexual exploitation can access the support they need anywhere, anytime. Mr. Speaker, to also to support shelters, we have invested $18.5 million over three years through the Transitional Housing Support Program. Once again, Mr. Speaker, under this government, we'll make sure no one is left behind. Once again, next question, member for Carleton. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question s'adresse à la ministre des Affaires francophones. Notre gouvernement est pleinement conscient qu'actuellement. We realize that Franco Ontarians. Our elderly in Ontario have fought to build solid foundations to benefit the Francophones. Mr. President, we know that access uh, for care is very important for uh, elderly people. Not only this allows a better communication with services, but it also ensures a better quality of lies, life and in uh, long-term care. Mr. President, the minister, can the minister explain what is our government doing to improve the services for our francophone? <laughs> Ministry, I thank my colleague for his her excellent question. Contrary to the Liberal government, who did not do anything in 15 years, our government, for the first time in the his, uh, Ontario history, has built a strategy for long-term care. We opened the enlargement of uh, the long-term care in Niagara. The Richelieu is one of 31 long-term care projects in the province where the services to francophones will be offered. The new resident residence has increased to 128 beds. The Ministry of Francophone Affairs works in collaboration with the Long-Term Care Ministry to make sure that people who receive long-term care receive the care that they need in their language of choice. Complementaire. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for the Minister for her answer. This is uh, excellent to know how our government is helping the Niagara population with this announcement. This investment, uh, as well as our strategy in French, gives priority to reinforce and to improve the services in French. Mr. President, this is important that the residents Uh, over uh, more than uh, receiving the services in their language of choice, receive uh, uh, language services that improve the, our, their health. The minister can, expli can explain the importance of these measures for the francophone in Ontario. La minister. Once we finish the uh, enlargement of the Richelieu Centre, we'll, we'll offer a real community feeling for the residents. For the first time in Ontario, we will have services in the continuum of care, long-term care, palliative care, and the community center and a cultural center, all in one campus. The Richelieu is a the enlargement proves our will to, ameliorate the, to, to improve the services in French everywhere in the province. My colleagues we will, and me, we will continue to deploy all the necessary efforts to ensure the well-being of the Francophone community and to answer to their needs. Thank you very much. This cela conclut. For me has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to invite everyone to rooms 228 and 230 for a Peter Rodet reception where you can get your picture taken with the Eastern Conference OHL trophy, the Bobby Orr trophy, as well as sample Ontario's best ice cream. Central Smith Creamery is there. Oh, big. <laughs> Thank you.
Now we're going to have a serious debate. <laughs> Member, or rather, the Minister of uh, Red Tape Production has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to take a moment and wish our colleague and the Government House Leader happy belated birthday. Saturday, he turned 25, Mr. Speaker. Point of order, the member for Niagara West. I would also invite everyone to rooms 228 and 230 this evening from 5 to 7 for the Niagara reception. Gather yeah, the Premier has a point of order. Birthdays, I want to wish Patrice Barnes a very happy birthday today, 25 years old. Thank you. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.